Hello and welcome to the February 2024 Longevity Review, presented to you by the Canadian Longevity Association, a federally incorporated nonprofit whose mission is to help accelerate the introduction of effective longevity treatments and to ensure their free availability to all Canadians. My name is Chris Linnell, and I am the founder and president of the association. We are a volunteer-run organization and are always looking for more help. So if you would like to assist us in achieving our goal, then please get in touch via the links below this video. In addition, you'll also find a link to the newsletter being discussed here. This month, we will take a look at how partial reprogramming extends the remaining lifespan of old naturally aged mice how the fasting mimicking diet reduces biological age, a comparison of in intermittent versus continuous dosing of rapamycin in mice, and a human senolytic trial, which raises some concerning questions. So let's take a look at our first study. This study involves one of the hottest areas in aging research at the moment, partial epigenetic reprogramming. Now, what is that? Now, partial epigenetic reprogramming, or just reprogramming for short, um, entails trying to reset the epigenome back to a more youthful state. Now, if you remember, the epigenome are, are the markers on top of the genome, which tell a cell which genes to turn on and off. Now, over the course of time, those markers change in a predictable fashion. The idea behind partial epigenetic reprogramming is to basically reset those markers back to a youthful state. Most prior studies into reprogramming have used transgenic mice, and when looking at lifespan, quite often have used mice with shortened lifespans. What makes this study stand out is the fact that they use normal, naturally aged mice with a diverse genetic background. In addition, whereas most prior studies used all four of the Yakamana factors, O, S, K, and M. This one only involved O, S, and K, because the fourth one, M, is a oncogene and might result in the formation of teratomas. So let's take a look at the study design and let's get, get down to it here. So firstly, they used uh, two viral vectors, uh, one which um, involved inserting the four uh, transcription factors, OCT4, SOX, two and KLF4, and a second vi viral vector, which basically switched those, um, those three factors on when they were exposed to uh, doxycycline, a um, common antibiotic, which is quite often used in these studies. Now, it was, it was injected into the eyes of the mice, and um, it, they used actually 120 four week old mice. So they are quite old, the equivalent of roughly 77 year old human. And they basically put the doxycycline in the drinking water of the mice one week on, one week off for the remainder of their lifespans. And if we look at the survival curve from the age of 124 weeks, you can see here that the black line are the controls. The gray line are the sort of his historical survival pattern of those same mice. So the controls basically mimicked the um, historical record, whereas the blue line shows the treated mice. And as you can see, there is a considerable improvement in their uh, lifespan. In fact, there was a 109% increase in medium lifespan. So when 50% of the mice had died. And you can see here the remaining lifespan of the mice um, out 24 weeks, and there was a considerable improvement um, for the mice treated with O, S, and K. In fact, it was a change from six to, sorry, eight to 18 and a half weeks. So a sort of a 10 week difference, which is a considerable amount for a mouse. Not only that, but after 18 weeks after injection, uh, the frailty index was considerably better in the treated mice. You can see here on the blue bar compared to the black bar of the controls. And that both of these cases, both remaining lifespan and the frailty index reached statistical significance. After that, the researchers also looked at uh, the expression of these factors in various organs and also how the, um, the various organs 
in this case, the um, the liver and the heart, how fast they um, they were their age was accelerating. And in both these cases, the red being controlled, the blue being the treated animals, the um, age acceleration was considerably less in the treated mice compared to the untreated mice. In addition, the researchers also um, took some skin cells from the scalp of a 65-year-old male. And once again, they found that the factors considerably reduced the uh, predicted biological age of those cells from, it looks like, 100 years back down to um, 80 years. And they had two different, I guess, doses of um, viral vectors. And um, yeah, the higher dose had a, a slight improvement, but but it was not not significant. But overall, it seems to show that um, this treatment certainly had a profound effect on the mice in question. Now, one thing, and I, actually one thing I didn't mention is the fact that they only used uh, male mice in this study due to not having enough old female mice, supposedly. So obviously, this needs to be. Um, redone using female mice as well to make sure that it works the same way in females as it does males. But another issue that they had uh, with, with this study was the fact that um, they had to use two vi viral vectors to uh, get those transcription factors and the thing that turns them on into cells, which means that not all cells received both of them, and the distribution in the body was uh, maybe not as thorough as it could have been. So the researchers then uh, managed to engineer a new sort of viral, viral vector, which just involved um, a single one. So it could hopefully diffuse more broadly in the mouse. And what they found was when they tested that on eight week and 82 week old mice, they found that a dose one tenth of that used in the study had some profound effects in the liver, heart and spleen of the animals. And in top row are young animals, the bottom row are older animals. And in those three organs, there was a quite considerable increase in these uh, three factors, OCT4, SOX2 and KLF4. There was um, less less of um, less expression in the brain, pancreas, and skin. But overall, this was a quite exciting study because, again, it's using normal mice. Um, it um, involves uh, only three of the four Yamanaka factors. And one thing the researchers also noted is that there were uh, no teratomas formed. So a, a teratoma is sort of a not quite cancerous, but a growing ball of cells, and you basically do not do not want them in your body. But overall, this is a very exciting study. As I say, it's the first time that uh, normal mice have had the remaining lifespan extended due to um, reprogramming, and this brings us a step closer to it uh, being tried out in humans. Though, of course, the authors do say that it needs to be tried out in larger animal models first and a lot of other studies need to take place first before it can be tried out in humans but uh but overall a very exciting study on to the next study this study looked at the effects of the fasting mimicking diet in humans now the fasting mimicking diet was developed by renowned longevity researcher Walter Longo to recapitulate some of the benefits of fasting without actually having to fast. Now, to gain the true benefits of fasting, you actually need to fast for several days to really turn on autophagy and um, reduce inflammation in the body. Now, fasting for several days is quite difficult. In fact, the longest fast I've ever done is less than 40 hours. Now, the fasting mimicking diet involves the participants actually eating food, but uh, at a much reduced level. So on the uh, it's over five days. On the first day, the person consumes 1,100 calories, and on days two to five, only between 700 and 800 calories. Not only that, but it also has a much reduced uh, protein level. 
Now, the idea is over those five days, the body is tricked into thinking that it is actually fasting and hopefully numerous health benefits come out of that. Now, there are actually two, um, two separate trials analyzed in this study, and they looked at, let's take a, a look at what they looked at. So here's first just how the study was conducted. Now, here we go. Let's open this up. So they looked at various biomarkers um, in the body, and overall, they had some very beneficial effects. So um, in each of these uh, these graphs on the left are the, uh, the the baseline of the participants, and the white bar is after three months of the fasting mimicking diet. I should actually say that the participants did five days of this fasting mimicking diet per month over the course of uh, three, and then I believe uh, you know over the course of three months, and you can see here. That's starting with A here. The BMI of the participants decreased, which was statistically significant. The total fat decreased as well, including uh, the sub um, subcutaneous fat. So that's the fat just underneath our skin, which is actually not that bioactive and not that dangerous for us, but it, it decreased in the, in the subjects. But more importantly, the visceral fat, so that's the fat that is around our organs, is very... Um, biologically active and causes quite a bit of um, quite a bit of problems to us if we have too much of it and that decreased um, significantly and in those participants who had a BMI over 25 there was also a considerable decrease in uh, that visceral fat not only the, the the fat around our organs but also the the fat in the liver decreased um, uh, in the uh, fasting mimicking participants and also in those participants once again who had a BMI over 25 and for those whose um, the fraction of the fat was over five percent so you can see most of them down here on the left um, actually were were sort of below below five percent those who um, had quite high levels of fat in their liver saw a once again a considerable decrease um, there was no significant change in fact it almost looks like maybe increase but yeah basically no significant change for those who had um, or the, the the fat around the pancreas now, in those who had high blood glucose levels, so in the uh, American system over 99, there was once again a considerable decrease in, I guess, the fasting glucose levels of those high glucose participants. And the HOMA score, so this HOMA IR, that's a, a marker of insulin resistance. Once again, for those who had higher, those high glucose levels, there was a significant decrease in the HOMA, HOMA IR score. And uh, HbA1c, which um, shows how much, um, how much in a sense, glucose you have over the past three months. For those with high glucose levels, there was also a decrease in the HbA1c um, levels. Um, the last three graphs here show the immune system basically or the lymphoid myeloid uh, ratio and uh, basically over the course of aging uh, there is a shift in the, the ratio the myeloid ratio increases um, which is uh, not something that people want so in the um, in the control study participants the there was no change between the baseline and after three months. However, in those participants doing the the diet, there was an increase in the lymphoid myeloid ratio, which is um, seems to portend possible uh, rejuvenation effect on the immune system. And for those who were over the age of forty, there was also a um, an a marked increase, a statistically significant increase in this ratio. Next, the researchers took a look at the effects on biological age. Now, they don't clearly specify exactly 
how they sort of measured this. It looks like it was a variation on the sort of the Morgan Levine pheno age clock. Now, Morgan Levine is actually one of the um, authors of this paper. So they looked at seven um, biomarkers and compared it to a national national sample. And what they found um, on the left here are the, the people on the fasting mimicking diet. On the right are the controls. And the black dotted line in the middle is a, sort of the baseline age. Now, the partic study participants were 50, on average, 52 years old. And they actually had a younger biological age than that to start with. So the people participating in this trial were clearly healthier than the average, um, average American. And what they found was where as you can see with the controls there wasn't really much change or if there was a change it was a slight increase however in the people on the fasting mimicking diet there was a reduction in this biological age according to these uh, biomarkers now the three dotted lines the green one is the average um, new age the red dotted line is the median so middle the um, change in age and the yellow dotted line is the modal. So the, the, the time point which had uh, the most participants at. And as you can see here, there was an average reduction of 1.5 years to the green. Uh, the median change was a reduction of 2.5 years and the modal was 3.5 years. So on and um, yeah, so basically two and a half year reduction in their biological age from the start of the trial after after three months. Now, an interesting thing in these next two to graphs, C and D, is well, C basically shows the baseline biological age of the y-axis, and the x-axis shows the change in um, biological age after three months. And it seems that people who were younger initially were more likely to actually see an increase. And in fact, just going back to these these first two, not everyone saw a decrease in their biological age. You can see from this the blue um the blue bulge there there were quite a number of people who saw an increase in their biological age. Now it turns out that those people who saw an increase, so the ones, the green dots here, the green and yellow dots on the right-hand side here, started out being um, biologically younger anyway. So they talk about maybe there being some normalization in their ages, whereas those people who had higher biological ages had a, um, a greater reduction or were more likely to have a reduction in their biological age. And also they found out there was no real association between um, BMI and change in um, biological age. So on, on D here, uh, once again, um, the y-axis shows the change in bio age and the x-axis shows the change in BMI. And there wasn't um, any statistical correlation. See, the statistics here is um, P, uh, P, the p-value is uh, point. Two nine and you need p value of uh, zero point zero five to be statistically significant. And likewise, when looking at those people who had a reduction, like so, this is only this this part of this chart. When they looked at the people who had a lowering of their BMI, there was no real, there was no statistically significant association between um, the change in BMI and uh, their, bio their uh, biological age. Now, F on the right here is sort of an interesting um, interesting graph because it sort of uses an attempt to uh, predict how doing this one cycle of, or three cycles of fasting mimicking diet, how much of an effect that has on eventual lifespan. Now, maybe take this with a, Bit of a, a pinch of salt or a fistful of salt, but it seems to show that people on this trial, if they lived out the remainder of their lives, those who did the uh, fasting mimicking diet, which is the red line, um, would have li would live longer than those of the controls, which is the black line. Now, 
I'm not sure how how serious I take this because it's just sort of a prediction, but interestingly enough, that's what they seem to show. Now, the researchers did some other predictions, which can be found in the supplementary material, which we'll just take a quick look at here. And what they were predicting was if somebody at from the age of 50 did three cycles of the fasting mimicking diet until the age of 70, and they wanted to see what the um, survival um, would be after the age of 70. And here is what the Kaplan-Meier survival estimates are. Uh, for those people, the blue is for people who did not do the um, fasting mimicking diet, and the red line shows those who did it yearly between the age of 50 and 70. So they seem to indicate that um, it really pushes out the survival curve to the right. And looking at uh, life expectancy, so left is the red is the um, annual three times a year uh, fasting mimicking diet, and the blue is no fasting mimicking diet. And well, you can see that rather than surviving to the age of 85 in the median, people might live to the age of 90. All cause mortality should be reduced, as well as heart disease mortality, cancer mortality, cerebral, cerebrovascular disease mortality, and also diabetes mortality. Now, once again, these are predictions, so make that what you of that what you will but sort of an interesting theoretical exercise. But overall, an interesting study showing that we might gain some of the benefits of fasting without actually having to fast. Now, Walter Longo has a company called Prolon, which actually sells this uh, fasting mimicking diet. And you can see here then the Canadian website it would cost you 265 Canadian dollars for um, a package of... Uh, of foods for five days that has been specifically tailored to this this diet but i've seen online there are various people who have produced sort of or reproduced the recipes um so that you could theoretically do that yourself without having to uh fork out that money but some obviously might be simpler just to um to uh, spend the money if you're interested in following this yourself now i've not done this myself thinking about it but um, anyway, just inform you that it, it is out there if you are also interested in trying to get some of the benefits of the fasting mimicking diet. Onward to the next study. This study is on rapamycin, which needs no introduction, but I'm going to give it one anyway. So rapamycin was the first molecule discovered which could increase the lifespan of a mammal. And it does so in very simplistic terms by flicking a switch found in all of our cells from growth to repair. And it does so by uh, I mean, turning on autophagy, which is the recycling mechanism in our cells, which gets rid of old damaged proteins and replaces them with better quality ones. So why another study on rapamycin in mice? Well, what sets this study apart is that it looked at the sex-specific effects of two different dosing regimes, either continuous dosing or inter intermittent dosing, and um, which is important because we need to try to figure out what the best dosing regimen for humans is. Anyway, let's take a look at this study. And firstly, let's look at how they planned it. And so you, at the top here, you can see in A, uh, the two different dosing regimens, either continuous dosing in purple here or intermittent, whereby the, the mice were fed rapamycin for one week, and then they had one week off while the, the levels of rapamycin decreased over that time. And you can see here in B how uh, in both males and females, the levels of rapamycin in their bodies increased. Orange bars are um, the intermittent dosing while they were on rapamycin. Green bar is uh, when they the week they were off it, and the purple bar is continuous dosing. And as you can see, um, interm intermittent dosing increased the levels of rapamycin, which decreased when they were um, no longer on it. However, continuous dosing, maybe unsurprisingly, ha uh, resulted in higher levels. And as seen in previous studies, uh, for whatever reason, 
um, females had a much higher higher levels of rapamycin than the males. Now, first looking at the effects on glucose tolerance, because that, that is one of the unfortunate side effects of um, rapamycin, that it can impair glucose tolerance. And looking at males first, once again, black line is control. Green is uh, intermittent when they are no longer on it. Orange is intermittent when they are taking rapamycin. And the purple is um, continuous dosing. And you can see here that uh, the glucose tolerance gets quite a bit dysregulated under continuous dosing. However, um, when during intermittent dosing, um, the levels, the, the high glucose levels are decreased, especially when they are no longer on it. And you can see on the right here, this is sort of the area under the curve. That's what AUC means. And continuous dosing has much sort of higher levels of glucose than the inter intermittent and control levels. Uh, same can be seen with females. In fact, they had a much sort of better glucose response to intermittent fasting than the males. You can see that the orange line is quite a bit underneath the purple one compared to the males here on the top. And once again, just looking at the area under the curve, continuous dosing had a much higher level than the intermittent dosing in females as well. So possibly intermittent uh, dosing of rapamycin has could have sort of fewer side effects in that regard um, of uh, glucose tolerance. Next, and perhaps most uh, interesting to us, are the uh, lifespan effects of uh, these two dosing regimens on rapamycin. And as you can see here, so we have um, male lifespan at the top, female lifespan at the bottom. And with these lifespan curves, the black line is the control, the green line is the intermittent regimen, and the purple line is the continuous dosing of rapamycin. And for, um, for each of these, there was an improvement over the control group. And indeed, the um, intermittent dosing in males increased median lifespan by 18% for the intermittent dosing regimen and 28% uh, on the continuous dosing. And the maximum lifespan as well increased. They, they didn't give a percentage figure here, but there was a statistical a significant increase in maximum lifespan as well. And for the females, for the, uh, once again, black control, green intermittent, purple continuous, the intermittent dosing increased median lifespan by 14%, and the continuous dosing increased it by 25%. And once again, there was also a, a significant increase in the maximum lifespan as well. So you can see for the most part, especially in the males, there was not that much of a difference between intermittent and continuous dosing, slightly greater difference um, among the female animals. Next, they looked at the physical performance and they used uh, two tests. One was a rotor rod, where, where basically there's a, a rod which the mice are trying to cling to as it rotates. And the longer that they can stay on it before they fall off shows, um, I guess, their coordination and strength and stuff like that. And also they tested um, endurance, which we'll see shortly. Now, for the males, um, oh, yeah, they tested it also after 12 months and 20 months. And for the males, the um, there was certainly an improvement. So I should just ex explain that um, the y-axis shows um, the seconds, how long they stay on the rod. And on the x-axis axis shows um, their training days. So usually animals improve as they um, um, get tested or get trained on this um, performance test over the course of four days. And once again, the black line is control, green is the intermittent, intermittent dosing, and the purple is continuous dosing. And for the males, the, at, at 12 months and at 20 months, there was a noticeable improvement between uh, the control and both dosing regimes. And um, so especially after 20 months, there wasn't really any difference between um, the continuous and the intermittent dosing re 
regimens. Now, for the females, after 12 months, there's basically no real difference between uh, the control and the uh, both dosing regimens. However, after 20 months, the continuous dosing showed an improvement compared to controls where there wasn't any um, statistical significance between the inter intermittent regime and um, the controls. Now, one thing I didn't mention was the fact that the mice were started on rapamycin after six months. So at the 12 month mark here, they'd been on rapamycin for six months already. Now at the bottom, looking at motor endurance, make this a bit bigger, there was no statistically significant change or, um, compared to controls. For Once again, black being controls, green being intermittent, purple being the continuous dosing. And for the males, there was um, you know, no real no real change. However, compared to the controls, that didn't, um, which declined between 12 and 20 months, there wasn't any decrease among the uh, intermittent fed mice and uh, maybe only a slight decrease in the continuous treatment. However, in females, um, there wasn't really any difference between the uh, controls and both dosing regimens they are, there was no statistical significance in the change and they all decrease between 12 months and 20 months of age next they looked at uh, heart function and now it looks like heart rate decreases over time and for the males there was uh, a clear improvement. In fact, the um, intermittent dosing regime in uh, their heart rate actually increased compared to a decrease in both the continuous and uh, the controls. Uh, how, however, with uh, females, there wasn't any statistical significant change. There was an improvement, I guess, or a... a um, less of a decrease in the uh, both um, dosing regimes, but it was not um, statistically significant. Now, the on C and D here, uh, the QT interval, um, that's a sort of electrocardiograph term, which um, can uh, indicate if there is left ventricle hypertrophy. And for the males, um, so it gets, I guess it gets worse over time. Now for the males, whereas the control got worse, both uh, dosing regimes improved the QT interval in males. However, it, it didn't seem to make a difference in the females. They both um, increased over the, between 12 and 20 months. They seem to have, the control animals seem to have started at a lower level. Now, looking at the weight of the hearts, because again, this is an indication of um, heart hi hypertrophy, so which means the uh, growth of the heart. So unfortunately, our hearts sort of grow in size, but um, they weaken even though they're getting bigger. And for the males, there wasn't any, uh, no significant difference between uh, the control and intermittent. However, there was a significant difference between the continuous and the control. For the females, likewise, there wasn't a significant difference between intermittent and control. However, there was a significant difference between the continuous dosing and uh, the control. So the hearts did not sort of grow as much, which again is a beneficial effect of rapamycin. Then they um, also looked at sort of various path pathological indicators. So they harvested some mice using a rather clinical term uh, after 24 months. And they looked at all these various um, pathological features when they examined the uh, organs of the animals. And linking to what I just previously mentioned, looking at um, heart hypertrophy. So white is mild, the gray is uh, severe. And once again, we got control intermittent and continuous. Um, there was no significant difference between the intermittent and control in males. However, there was a quite, uh, there was a significant uh, lessening of heart hypertrophy in the continuous dosing regimen here. And for the females, there wasn't a statistical significance, but it was better than uh, both 
intermittent and um, continuous dosing were obviously a little bit better than the controls. And I mean, you could say the same thing about the intermittent among males, maybe a slight improvement compared to controls. But uh, considering the number of animals, which wasn't that huge, this, uh, actually, I guess it, they show how many animals were at the bottom here, not too many, 25, 36, 53, and likewise, 26, 32, 37, small numbers. So that's why uh, any of these changes did not reach statistical significance. Now, among the uh, uh, li liver tumor score, because mice are quite prone to getting cancer, and especially in lab conditions, most mice die of cancer. And you can see here that certainly amongst the uh, very severe m amount of tumors, there was a decrease in um, sort of tumor incidents, especially between the continuous and control, less so among the intermittent. In fact, it looks like slightly more tumors, but less, less of the severe and very severe tu tumor burden. Um, this was more marked in the females in terms of, I guess, um, certainly the, the, the amount of animals which had no tumors found. Um, this increased from the control to the intermittent and also to the continuous. It didn't quite reach statistical significance, the p-value being uh, 0.068. And, and to reach statistical significance, it has to be 0 0.05 or below. But still looks like lower. there was a lower tumor burden. And after all, Rapamycin is also used as a cancer drug, so that's no real surprise. Now, CPN is chronic progressive neuropathy. And here, for both uh, males and females, there was an improvement compared to control for both intermittent and continuous, with the continuous being better. And certainly, the, um, the continuous dosing regime had a much higher statistical significance than, um, as you can see, by the three stars here compared to intermittent. And although the females didn't reach statistical significance, at least the eye, on the eye test here, there was less uh, chronic progressive neuropathy. And certainly, either the intermittent or continuous did not seem to have any moderate levels. Now, D here is looking at inflammation and in uh, adipose tissue, so uh, fat cells. And there was, in the males, there wasn't a statistical signif uh, significant difference between control and both dosing regimes. So it seemed, again, the eye test seems to show that there was an improvement. In the females, there was a statistical um, significant difference between uh, control and the intermittent and continuous. Now, looking at pancreas inflammation, it actually looks like that uh, in the males, although there was no, again, not statistically significant, there seems to be uh, more pan pancreatic inflammation under a continuous than, than control or indeed intermittent dosing in the males. Whereas in the females, the reverse takes place in that continuous dosing had much lower levels of inflammation of the pancreas compared to control or the intermittent. Now, looking at kidneys, much more, a much greater effect can be seen. So in kidney inflammation, um, the continuous dosing had much uh, lower levels of inflammation, again, reaching statistical significance. Same with the females with the intermittent regime being sort of somewhat in the middle. And once again, looking at fat, but this time, um, I guess white adipose tissues. Oh yeah, so the one before BAT would have been um, brown adipose tissues are two different types of fat that we have in our bodies. And for the white adipose tissue, which is the most common uh, form of uh, fat in our bodies, uh, once again, inflammation certainly seemed to decrease um, in in both males and females, reaching statistical significance uh, for both continuous do dosing regimes, though the intermittent seemed to show in, an improvement as well. Now, moving on to the next one, which is spleen pathology. And once again, there was a difference between control and both um, dosing regimes reaching significance 
for the intermittent and continuous, and um, similar for the females, though it did not reach statistical significance on either um, of the dosing regimes. But yes, there was certainly an improvement in spleen pathology. And likewise with spleen weight, I guess heavier, heavier spleen is worse. Not quite sure about why, but that seems to be the case here. And the spleen weight was lower in for both males and females. The spleen weight was quite a bit lower than the controls. Now, the last thing that they looked at was sort of the uh, immune function. I won't go into the details here because it's a bit, it's a bit complicated, but um, they found that in females, there was a greater change by rapamycin in sort of the immune cells transcription factors. And one thing they did find was there was reduced uh, SASP, so the um, senolytic associated um, secretory uh, phenotype, basically the inflammatory molecules which are released by senescent cells. And there was a reduction in the, the SASP levels uh, for in both males and females. And there was also an increase in levels of ERBB4, which uh, is supposedly uh, beneficial for stem cells, rejuvenation and, and, and heart health. So there you have it. A uh, very interesting study, finally sort of really looking, parsing the differences between males and females on these two different dosing regimes. And so which should hopefully give us some indication of, or some help towards uh, trying to figure out a, a, hum, a, a human dosing regime, though, of course, bearing in mind that mice are not humans, and we need to await the results of the current trials in humans on, uh, on rapamycin, which actually the first one, important one, the PEARL trial should be coming out later this year, and that uh, tested a few different dosing regimes in humans, looking specifically on sort of longevity markers and uh, very tailored towards longevity. So watch this space for that study to come out, hopefully relatively soon. And now our final study. So here we have the first new human senolytic trial in quite a while, this time looking at changes to epigenetic clocks or DNA methylation clocks as they say here. Now, just a little bit of a reminder. Senolytics are drugs which remove senescent cells from the body, and senescent cells are cells which have become dysfunctional. They stop doing what they're supposed to be doing, instead sort of, sort of hang around and secrete inflammatory factors causing uh, dysfunction throughout the body. Now, senescent cells accumulate with age, and the idea is if they can be removed, then uh, levels of inflammation should be reduced and various dysfunction should be reduced as well. So let's take a look at uh, the study, starting with the study design. And it was a small study, as all these often are, with um, 19 participants in both arms. And it had a quite interesting design. The participants took 50 milligrams of desatinib and 500 milligrams of quercetin on three consecutive days per month for six months. And then after a one year sort of washout period, um, 10 of the original participants plus nine new ones took um, once again, 50 milligrams of desatinib, 500 milligrams of quercetin, plus with the addition of fizetin, another uh, senolytic, once again for three consecutive days per month for six months and various thing, um, blood samples were taken to the three month and six month stage for the first sample uh, first part of the trial and after six months for the uh, second part of the trial and they tested numerous different uh, epigenetic clocks uh, including first generation, second generation, and third generation. So you can see the clocks here on the left. And the first three are um, the first generation clocks, Grim Age, Phenoage, 
are um, sort of the second generation clocks and the Dunedin Pace is a third generation clock. Now, as you can see here for uh, comparing the baseline with three months, a few of these clocks had a statistically significant change. And But unfortunately for the first generation clocks, there was actually an increase in sort of epigenetic age. You can see here the Horvath pan tissue clock uh, went from minus 1.4 to plus 1.2 after three months before decreasing again after six months. Same thing with the Horvath skin blood clock and the, um, the Hanum, Hanum one. So if we were sort of expecting that all the clocks should show a decrease in epigenetic age, that was not the case. Same thing with uh, the DNA pheno age, which um, uses various sort of blood biomarkers to um, estimate biological age. They also showed um, an increase after six months and a decrease after, sorry, an increase after three months and a, followed by a decrease after six months. Now, there wasn't any statistical change in the second, um, the Grim Age or the Dunedin pace change. But um, again, the authors were sort of expecting all these clocks to show a reduction. So the fact that they didn't was a little bit sort of perplexing to the authors. Now, when they also added uh, in the second part of the trial, when they added uh, Fizetin, um, there wasn't really any change apart from the Horvath pan tissue. Uh, so there wasn't any statistically significant change apart from the Horvath pan tissue clock, which once again also showed an increase. Now, again, once although the other sort of clocks didn't show a statistically significant change, just sort of eyeballing these figures, there seems to have been an increase in the um, first generation clocks, whereas there wasn't really much change in the second or third generation clocks. Now, here's sort of a bigger analysis of these first generation clocks. And you can see, so the one on the left is the Horvath pan tissue clock. Uh, the one in the middle is the Horvath skin and blood one. And the one on the right, C, is the Hanum one. And you can see for all of these, well, the first one, there was an increase followed by a decrease. There was a continuous sort of increase in the second one. And once again, the second and the third one, there was an increase followed by a decrease after six months. Now, they next looked at um, the effects on telomeres. And what they found was that um, the telomere length seemed to actually decrease over the course of the six months for uh, it in the first trial. Now, they didn't show the results for the, the second trial, but they basically said that there wasn't any, any um, significant change taking place there. So normally you'd think that, or the hope would be that the telomere length would either increase or maintain the same. So maybe slightly concerning that it seemed to decrease, even though it wasn't a huge amount, that still it was moving in the opposite direction than we would have liked. They also looked at what's called a mitotic clock, which uh, shows sort of uh, stem cell division. And once again, this is looking at the um, dysatinum and quercetin arm. And here, there was a small decrease after three months, followed by a statistically significant increase after six months. So then seems to imply that at least stem cell replication or stem cell division improved after, after six months. Now, they also looked at um, how the immune cells changed over the course of these uh, studies. And in the first dysatinib and quercetin study, three of the uh, mark uh, three of the immune cell types um, had a statistically significant change. And sort of unfortunately, these were um, the naive cells. So it was the CD4 T naive cells, the B naive cells, and uh, monocytes. And in each of these, after 
six months, uh, three months and six months, there was a decrease in these levels, or at least certainly with the, the CD4 T naive cells, whereas the uh, B naive cells showed a decrease followed by an increase, and the monocytes showed a decrease followed by an increase as well. Now, we would like to have more naive cells because those are cells which have not sort of come into contact with infection and we need lots of naive cells to um, I guess prepare our bodies for future infections so a decrease in these values are slightly possibly concerning though um, it's, it's re remains to be seen now with the with the addition of physetin there was only a statistically significant change uh, in the B naive cells here you can see once again after six months there was a decrease in these B naive cells so um, once again slightly concerning in this regard they next looked at the correlation between uh, the clocks and these immune cells and without going into the detail of this of this figure, um, they found that although immune cells can influence clocks, but uh, after adjustment, the increase in age in the first generation clocks uh, was not due to them. The next thing that they looked at were inflammatory markers. However, they instead of measuring those markers directly, they used methylation risk scores, surrogates to predict and quantify predicted changes in circulating proteomic markers. So the, actually the authors say that they should have um, done some direct measurement of these inflammatory markers. But one thing they did find is that some of the values did decline over the course of uh, six months, such as CCL11 here, went from minus 007 to 004, and um, CCL17, and uh, CRP. But there wasn't a huge, although some of them were statistically significant, there wasn't a huge change in these... Um, well, the surrogate markers of inflammation, which is sort of a little bit unfortunate, as you would have hoped that by the uh, reduction of, of uh, senescent cells, the amount of inflammatory markers released by those senescent cells would have decreased considerably in the uh, participants after six months. So all in all, this is a bit of a mixed bag uh, when it comes to this study. And um, I mean, the hope would have been that all of these uh, parameters would have improved linearly in a positive direction. The fact that the first generation clocks seemed to show an increase in age, to that the fact that the telomeres did um, decreased and that there sort of wasn't a more profound change among the um, inflammatory markers you know, poses more questions than they have answers for. I mean, again, once again, this was a very small study, only 19 participants, there was no control group. And the authors themselves state that, uh, you know, future further studies are needed. But this is an important one to sort of, again, just provide more data for our understanding of how senolytics work in humans. And hopefully in the next year or two, we should see a lot more studies coming out because there, there have been numerous studies in disatin using disatinib and quercetin and also physetin on its own. And a lot of these have actually been completed in terms of the actual uh, trial themselves, but it uh, takes a while for those uh, trials to be analyzed and then the papers to be published. But hopefully, fingers crossed, we shall have a lot more studies coming out again in the next year or two, and therefore have a lot more data and understanding about how senolytics are working. But it certainly gives a little slight, slight pause for thought, and maybe it's wise not to jump into using senolytics yourself until those further studies are released. So that bring, wraps up this month's 
edition of the longevity review if you enjoyed it then please hit the like button subscribe to this channel and if you are so inclined and want to support the canadian longevity association's mission then please um, use the link below this video to give us a donation that would be very much appreciated anyway until next month take care and uh, see you then bye